Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, have everybody's having a great uh, couple of days here at CIS. Uh, I'm here to talk about identity management is a people problem. I'm the CTO at Squid, actually. Um, nope. But details doesn't really matter. Ask me, ask me later. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, we have an uh, um, IDAS product that does identity administration and provisioning and things like that. So uh, a lot of some of the stuff that I'll be talking about is actually uh, come from what we found out by talking to customers and in you know trying to rethink the identity management problem. Um, the title doesn't refer to the fact that identity management is a problem about people and it shouldn't be. So anybody who was expecting an internet of things and identity talk, or as Paul Matson calls it, idiot talk. Uh, sorry about that. This is actually a talk about identity management being a problem for people, and it really doesn't have to be that way. Uh, identity management is still very much a headache uh, when it comes to uh, people who need to use the system. When you're, talk, when you're talking about your employees, you're talking about contractors, partners, even your customers, they're all really confused when interacting with identity management systems because they really can't make head or tail of it. it it's almost like they're speaking a different language. When they need to get access to something, they don't know where to go, how to get it. Um, if they need to do their job, they're not exactly sure what to look for, what to request, what, what access they need. And oftentimes they get bogged into these detailed processes that really isn't really related to the day job and they just want to get out of it. And that actually also uh, extends to the people who are using these identity management systems from the other side of the equation. Uh, you have your, you know, executives who are really trying to figure out the, uh, a solution to the problems that they have, and they're looking at the identity management space, and they're not quite sure what to use in order to solve that problem that they have. So a lot of times they'll make a leap of faith and deploy it, and once they've deployed it, they're still not sure if it's solving the problem that they have. And on the other side, you have business analysts who are spending hours, days, weeks, months, years of their lives trying to figure out how to deploy these things. You go, ID staff who are not trained in these systems, or who, for whom these systems are very unnatural, and it's just one more thing for them to take care of. Uh, and you have identity vendors like me who go in saying, we know exactly what it is, and we're very confident we know exactly what we're doing, and it works for the first customer, and then we go to all these other customers, and the way it worked the first time doesn't work for anybody else. And we're left scratching our heads, like, why did it work then and not the other way around? And what do I have to change about my system? So you really have a lot of people who just don't know how to make their identity management systems work for them, how to use it in an effective manner. And it stems from the fact that we all start from this very basic notion that we know identity is important. But as humans, we're trained that if something's important, well, it must be complicated. So identity management has to be complicated. And like we've all been taught from the beginning, uh, as I'm teaching my son nowadays, well, once something is complicated, you break it down and you tackle each part of it. So we take identity management and we break it down into these separate different use cases and the list of use cases increases every single year. You have more and more things being lomed on to the topic of identity management. And you basically take these solutions that used to work in the analog world, transpose them into the digital world, and hope it works. And then you put all of those things together, and you get an identity management system that is basically over-engineered. It's extremely brittle. It's really hard to maintain. It's almost impossible to use. And it really does does the thing it's meant to do really well only when everything works exactly correctly. So you basically have the system where you're basically disincentivizing everybody who needs to be using that system from using it. And the way we solve that is by trying to in, 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 uh, incorporate into the architecture the most flexible computing device we can find, which is people. So we try to take as many use cases as we can, and we basically whittle it down and try to push more and more responsibility on the, the people who are interacting with the system. And so we end up with systems that have um, approval workflows where uh, basically we expect people to be able to know what to look for in order to request that. And we expect approvers to know what they're uh, approving and what the impact of that approval might be. And we're expecting managers and auditors to look at this massive recertification chart and at a glance look at it and not only understand what it means, but understand the impact of what that is to the business, to the security of the domain, and things like that. And the, fun, the, the flaw in this um, idea is that just like I imagine, people are actually not uh, you know, a good computing device to use in this architecture, if you will. Or as Quinn Norman puts it so eloquently, people are broken too. 
more specifically in our context, we're asking people to look at these entitlements and this access in the context of approvals and certifications and requests and all this stuff, and asking them to judge the risk that is involved in that. We're asking them to look at all this stuff and think about it from a security perspective when they're really not secure, trained security professionals. And as Jeff uh, says, you know, tried to point out, as human beings, we're only marginally better than squirrels when it comes to judging technology risk. And that makes me feel very nervous when I think about <laughs> what we're relying on for, our, for, for securing our most valuable assets. So the fundamental flaw that it, this basically comes back to is that we haven't thought about the usability of these systems. Uh, I've been talking about it for a long time, but Eve really uh, put it very succinctly. She said, we need to start thinking of usability issues as vulnerabilities. Every time we create a usability issue for a user, a security breach gets its wings. And what we're, what we're doing is we're putting more and more responsibility for the security aspects of our systems onto people who are fundamentally not trained to use them. And so what we're doing is creating these massive processes that are asking users to do so much that they're just not equipped to do. And the solution for that, again, is we think, well, let's just throw more data at them, give them more information, put more information on dashboards and stuff like that, and that will somehow make them understand what it is that they're meant to do, and we'll, they'll do it. And fundamentally, people are just bogged down by this. They don't have the context. So what are they ultimately doing? They're really just looking at guidelines that they've gotten from somebody. Uh, there's a lot of rubber stamping going on. People aren't really looking at it from that perspective. And so what you're finding is you have deployments that basically say they meet the letter of the regulations they're meant to satisfy, but they're not really doing the spirit. They're not fulfilling the spirit of what those regulations are meant for. You're not really getting out of it the expectations. So even people who pass their security audits with respect to things like recertification, et cetera, find that they still end up in situations where people have access they should not have. Uh, they're getting access they shouldn't have gotten in the first place and stuff like that. And we haven't even gotten, you know, scratched the surface of the problem yet because most identity management systems today don't even think about unstructured data. All the IP and assets that we have in the form of files and media and other digital uh, media that we have, identity management systems will not even look at those. This identity management deal very well with things like groups and profiles, but when you're talking about something like a file that has credit card information in it or a spreadsheet, that, uh, or a document that has valuable IP that you've collected as a pharmaceutical company or all your research data, your identity management systems don't really understand that. So they're not able to look at it. And obviously, you know, we've been hearing a lot about uh, how this is going to explode with more and more assets coming under the purview of identity management, more and more things where we care about how we manage the data, control the data permissions when it comes to things like uh, your devices, your API endpoints, and your wearables. Oh, did I say wearables? Uh, Paul? I didn't mean to jumpstart you if you're here. Um, Paul never met a buzzword he didn't like. Anyway, so when Ian's not freaking me out by talking about extinction, extinction events, um, he actually makes a very good point in his killing identity management uh, talk. Um, enjoy. Um, uh, we fundamentally do have to look at identity management and rethink how we've been doing it. The old way of doing it is not going to scale, it's not going to work, and we need to fundamentally look at the building blocks of identity management and how we're going to rethink it. And Ian's talk is excellent in talking about some of, the, some of the technical underpinnings on that. What I want to talk a little bit about is some of the business underpinnings of that, how enterprises think about identity management, what they should be thinking about. And what we really fundamentally should be thinking about is stop using humans as pieces in the architecture for, to do things that they really shouldn't be doing. We can't use people as building blocks when we really should be relying on technology to do those pieces. We've, we've you know, burdened them far too long. And so I'm going to talk a few things that are in the, pro, in the way of happening today, some things that are a little further out, sort of coming together. Uh, nobody's really figured it out yet, I feel, but I've seen, seen these all over the place, people doing different parts of this, and I'm going to sort of uh, hopefully be able to tie them all together into a cohesive um, system. So going back to our security practitioners and what they mean for us, um, I, I thought this was fairly insightful, that when we think, when we think about uh, what we call identity management today, or what these identity projects that we're doing, 
the majority of the work that's been doing there is really about controlling access to resources, right? It's not really about the identity itself. It's actually about controlling access to resources, controlling access to information. You're really thinking about, the reason you're thinking about groups and policies and approval workflows is not so much about the person as much as it's about the data or the resource or the endpoint that you're trying to protect. And so really, the, that, that, if you have that mind shift, my, mindset shift, you can start thinking and moving your focus from being very much driven around people, which is incredibly nuanced and hard to manage, to start thinking about the data itself and start thinking about the security aspects of it from the data side of it, which is actually a lot easier to think about because it makes it a little bit more concrete. And you can start thinking about situations there that are more well-defined, whereas with people you really don't know, you have to deal with all these move or join or leave or processes, and you think about context shifts all the time and things like that. So defining policies and processes from the person's side of the equation is really hard. And when you start thinking about data, uh, one of the things that we've been seeing um, was uh, the death of least privilege. And I'm, not, I'm sorry if I'm using the death of something. I, I really shouldn't be doing that, but I, I vowed I wouldn't do it, but I couldn't resist it. Just because we had this amazing uh, Twitter debate uh, between a few of us that, ha that was triggered by Aunt uh, Allen at Gartner proclaiming on stage that least privilege was dead. And least privilege has been a fundamental principle in security for a very long time, and we all bought into it. I, I certainly bought into it a long time ago. And what we, what we worked through in that dis discussion was that it's not so much about the fact that um, least privilege is dead, but rather that you use least privilege in the places where it is appropriate. So it goes back to risk-based security. You shouldn't be thinking about every single thing in the context of least privilege. There are plenty of places where giving additional permissions, or rather dealing with more coarse-grained privileges as opposed to fine-grained privileges is perfectly valid because you can, to some extent, trust your users. You can look at the risk involved and understand that those things are not going to create a massive security breach off the bat. It's not about, you not, it's not about, it's about basically understanding your security models and applying uh, the, the least privileged concept in the right places. And so it goes back to the idea of the less privileges I create, essentially, the less, less number of privileges that I have that need to be assigned, that need to be managed, that need to be reviewed, I can simplify my security policies. I can make sure that I have policies that are more manageable and uh, scalable. And what that allows me to do is two things. Number one, I can, my policy-based provisioning, for example, uh, the way in which uh, my policies automatically figure out the privileges that I need to grant to people ahead of time, they don't necessarily fundamentally change, but because you've reduced the number of privileges, you're now covering more of what you need to cover and leaving a smaller sliver that needs to be covered in an ad hoc fashion, which is extremely important when you think about revisibility and things where people need to make decisions and understand what's going on. The second piece is, by doing this, you're also able to make policy definition more approachable. You can make it something that's easier to manage for individuals who are not trained in security. And so you can go from having policy definition screens that look like this and require somebody to understand XML schemas or JSON or code, and you can move to a more usable policy definition model where they're dealing with more natural language policies. Uh, you see this in, sim sim in you know, it's parallels things like the if this then that movement where you, your SOA systems, instead of being these complex um, BPMN or BPEL based systems, are now moving to something like a very simple if then, if then else statement. So those things allow you to then have your policies move closer to your end users. So a departmental head or somebody who's working on a research project can define their own policy based provisioning based on what they're working on without requiring IT to get involved. And that's extremely empowering because you're now facilitating the user and you're removing the, the need to have complex IAM workflows. So complex IAM workflows are the bane of our industry. I've worked on access requests and recertification for well over a decade. So saying that they should die is very bittersweet for me, but they should die because nobody, nobody can do access requests properly and certainly nobody can do recertification properly. And the way you get rid of access requests, like I said, is first of all, you're doing more policy-based provisioning, which is reducing the number of ad hoc stuff, but you're moving to, or you're reviving a model that used to exist that we thought IAM was killing, but it's now making a comeback, which is access controlless. 
what do you mean by access control is coming back? Nobody likes access control lists. Well, we actually are going back into the future because the model for accessing data is now based on sharing. In modern applications, in cloud-based applications especially, but most applications are now embracing the concept of sharing as the way by which somebody gets access to something. So you can start from that very simple, if you want to call it least privileged model, where the only person who has access to something is the person who created it, and say, that person is responsible for sharing that and giving access to somebody else. You've moved the sharing model down to the end user to be very ad hoc. No policies involved, no ID security involved. It is very sh sharing model. And so basically, all, what you have at the end of it is back to, you're back to an access control list. It's a very simple ACL-based model where you simply say, this object can be uh, managed by um, these lists of people. You can deal with groups, et cetera, whatever you have. But it's essentially just an ACL. And sharing works. There are a number of organizations that I've talked to now who have embraced the model of sharing as the way in which data access is controlled, in which resource access or asset access is controlled. Because they, first of all, trust their users. They rely on the fact that their users are doing the best job that they, they can, and they have good intentions, and so they're going to share the data only with the people that they know it should be shared with. But you don't take you know, the old trust but verify model, you don't stop at just saying, let them share, and that's it. You then back them up by monitoring, risk ana analytics, and uh, with the advances that have happened now, getting into risk analytics that create predictive actions that actually can uh, prevent actions from happening based not on predefined policies, but on behavioral analysis, on ba based on the data that's involved, understanding the data and seeing uh, uh, rich looking at all the data that's available in the context, in the environment, and using that. And so what you find is um, you, know, you have all these different services where all this data exists, and people are doing a lot of work on sharing that data. Um, but at the heart of it is still the identity. It's st still the person involved who's looking at that information. And the old model used to be that never worked is you're going to mine the logs, right? That's, that was the promise of the SIEM systems that we would mine the logs and figure all this stuff out and it would somehow work. And nobody got that to work by integrating SIM with identity management. But the new model of APIs allows you to use a variety of services that provide more granular controls, not by having to do all this massive mine log mining, but by simply looking at events that are happening, extracting the data from those events by using this in a more collaborative fashion and being able to do things like um, I'm going to geofence this document, and if this, somebody should, tries to share with somebody else who's outside the geofence, I'm just going to block it. Or I'm going to allow them to share it, but if the data inside the document contains you know, a particular tag or something like that, I'm going to watermark it and stuff like that. There's a lot of that kind of stuff that's happening where you're actually using rich contextual data to create new perimeters. Uh, Andre talked about identity being the new perimeter. The new perimeters are powered by identity, but they're also powered by the identity data that is richer, and you're using um, simpler systems like Zapier, like if this, then that, in order to create more flexible security models that are more easy to manage and maintain. You don't have to go through these massive um, engineering projects in order to do that. Now, the fundamental piece in this is that, like I said, it's the identity data. Your identity pr is providing context. And in order to make that context work, in order for it to solve the problem the way we've been talking about, we need to get beyond the uh, an idea of identity purely being attributes. Identity is not just attributes. Identity is a lot of rich metadata. And that metadata means something. The NSA figured this out. It's about time we did. Metadata provides us that context in order to make those risk-based decisions. By knowing who shared with whom and having that data in the system, you can use that data to then predict who they should be sharing with, what sharing is allowed, what sharing is not allowed, so that if somebody else, some new um, entity in the system gets the data, you can actually do some analysis and instead of just being in default deny mode, take a risk-based decision that allows that sharing to happen and provide collaboration not just within your enterprise boundary, but even beyond your enterprise boundary. Think of pharmaceuticals who need to work with other uh, people outside the pharmaceutical industry, working with researchers at university, sharing information with them. You need rich data about well, is that university have a, uh, an agreement with this, um, with this pharmaceutical in, um, entity? That data is not tracked on each individual person. You shouldn't be doing that. 
It should be something that exists outside of it. It's part of the broader identity context and it's part of the identity graph uh, that you rely on. All of that is backed by the need to have rich, I don't want to say big data, but basically the ability to mine that data and use that information to make these decisions. And it goes back to the fact that human beings aren't equipped to make these decisions in a lot of cases. We don't judge security risk the, the way that we should. We're, ten, as I think Bruce Schneier said, we're prone to exaggerating what we feel are big security risks and underplaying what are actual normal secure, everyday security risks. But with machine learning, what we're seeing in many industries, but especially in security, you're now able to get to a point where, again, you don't need to have these predefined policies, which is really what kills us, or these predefined workflows, but you can rely on the system to learn as it goes along, apply these algorithms, use information, like I said, that's from the identity graph, like tags, like watermarking in documents, uh, the, the, the uh, risk or security levels in the data, and may use that to make decisions regarding your security policies. So a lot of this is coming together today. Like I said, different customers are using it in different parts. Um, uh, but nothing's, I mean, it's starting to coalesce. And when it does, you're going to be glad that when Bill comes around and asks for those TPS reports, you have Hal on your side to say no. <laughs> With that, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Yes. Well, for one, sharing tends to create um, other owners, if you will. But even if you don't, that's where having systems like um, some of the systems that I pointed out on the screen, the, those services, they actually alert you to those kinds of scenarios where they'll say this object is now an orphan. And this is where some of that communication becomes really important between these systems, the, the loose integration, like, I, like I, as I called it, which is based on APIs and things like if this, then that, or Zapier, is when in the identity management system somebody is terminated, it can just publish an event saying this person was terminated and publish it to one of those other services, which then knows what other objects that person owned and goes off and does what it needs to do in order to figure out who should be the new owner or alert somebody or something to that effect. That's exactly the, that kind of communication, loose communication based on APIs between these services really at the heart of what, how, how this will happen. Okay, um, I guess that's it. <laughs>